This is Duke University. Good and welcome back. My name is Guy Charles. I'll be the moderator for this panel. Um, and the title of the panel is The ACA Litigation as Popular Constitutionalism. Um, I'll also be introducing the paper of Ernie Young, who's here to my left, followed, and I will be followed by a response by Ernie. Uh, and then Neil Siegel will introduce Brian Leach's paper, uh, followed by a response by Brian. And then afterwards, we'll have Jack Balkin and Ted Ruger, who will provide, who will round up the panel as panelists. So everybody will have about 10 minutes, and we'll try to get uh, as much questions in uh, before the end. All right, so I'll be fairly short with um, my comments and introduction of Ernie's paper. Ernie and I had a 45-minute discussion about his paper yesterday afternoon, which uh, Siegel found so interesting that he shut his door as we were talking. Um, so I don't know if that was because Ernie's views were so objectionable or, um, or Neil didn't find my views persuasive. Uh, Ernie's paper is entitled Popular Constitutionalism and the Under-Enforcement Problem, the Case of the National Health uh, Healthcare Law. Uh, as uh, Jack said this morning about a paper, Ernie's paper has two ideas that are in the title, under-enforcement and popular constitutionalism. So let's talk a little bit about under-enforcement. Uh, Ernie advances a number of different points. Uh, the first is that the current court, uh, the court currently under enforces federalism, uh, and if the Health Care Act, the ACA, is challenged and is upheld, it is uh, likely because of this current enforce under enforcement of federalism, uh, which uh, uh, federalism suffers from. Um, Ernie then essentially assesses the likelihood that the court will continue to under-enforce federalism uh, and thus uphold the act, uh, which leads to some observations from the paper. One is that under-enforcement is not a static proposition. That is, the constitutional principles that get under-enforced changes over time. Then the next question could be, uh, and this is a question that Ernie addresses, what accounts for this change over time? So Ernie notes, for example, that the court's perceptions of which institutional constraints warrant under enforcement has a lot to do with what is going on uh, in the broader society. So there's a canvassing of a number of the areas, and Ernie points out, that some areas were under enforced at a particular time, they're no longer under enforced, and federalism was not under enforced at a particular time, but is now under enforced, and a lot of that is a function of what the court thinks is going on uh, in, in society. Now applied specifically to the Health Care Act, Ernie argues that it is important to view the suits challenging the Health Care Act within the context of a broader popular debate with respect to the role of government. Uh, we are in the midst of a period of popular constitutional uh, contestation, uh, and the assumption is that this popular constitutional contestation may affect how the court views uh, the ACA when it ultimately comes before the Supreme Court. It is this popular constitutionalism that is, uh, that is debating the role of the federal government that is then likely to have an impact on the court's views and, um, and address the problem and the question of under enforcement. So we have under enforcement uh, of federalism. We also have popular constitutionalism, and popular constitutionalism, at least as Ernie's describing it, is not just the Tea Party, but sort of this large debate with respect to the role of the federal government. And the assumption is that this popular constitutionalism will have some impact on under enforcement because the court pays attention to these types of moves. All right, so popular constitutionalism becomes a remedy for under enforcement. Uh, so a very interesting uh, paper, very interesting proposition, and um, not too difficult to state. So I want to raise two initial questions for Ernie. He's a, my fellow panelists uh, will have a lot to say on popular constitutionalism, so I want to leave plenty of room for them to talk um, also about this issue. But the first question is, um, look, this idea of under-enforcement presupposes a certain baseline. 
all right, that is that we have some notion of what is the proper place of constitutional interpretation of, of, of federalism. And so Ernie argues that the rules, some of the rules and the tests that we use um, right there to help us understand what that baseline is. But what's missing is a, um, is a, is a sense of where exactly is the proper interpretation of uh, of federalism. Now, of course, one could guess what Ernie thinks that proper interpretation is, but really from a doctrinal perspective. So this is why Professor uh, Dean uh, Chemerinsky said this morning that he thought from a doctrinal basis and a constitutional basis, the arguments in favor of the constitutionality of the ACA are fairly easy. Now, Ernie says, well, the reason why these arguments are, the constitutional arguments are easy is because we have under enforcement. Now, I think all of this begs a question of constitutional baselines that we cannot avoid. We have to have a better sense of, well, what is the proper methodology or the proper interpretation of the Constitution with respect to federalism? So it's not obvious to me that one can talk about under enforcement unless you talk about the prior question, which is one of baselines. All right, second. Um, what is the work that is being done by this conception of popular constitutionalism, specifically with respect to the ACA? Uh, so it's not clear that the concept of popular constitutionalism necessarily leads to judicial review, and doesn't, and from there, it doesn't necessarily lead to judicial invalidation of the ACA. So really, what is the work that is being done by popular constitutionalism? Now, this could be another way of continuing the conversation from this morning about the political safeguards of federalism. So one way to think about this is, look, we have had this debate, and we're having this debate, um, broad debate within the polity with respect to the size and the scope of the federal government, and one side lost. Um, given that they lost in the political process, uh, what then is the reason for turning to the courts and to say, well, wait a minute, there's this popular uh, constitutional movement that is objecting to, at least reacting to the size of the federal government, and we need you to pick a particular side and enforce what we view, what some of us view anyway, to be the proper line uh, for the Constitution. So, so really, what is the contribution of popular constitutionalism um, and how is it that we can say that there's a particular direction that popular constitutionalism will lead us to think about uh, specifically with respect to the, to the ACA? All right, let me stop here. And um, there, there are many more uh, that one can say about Ernie's thoughtful paper, but uh, uh, many of us will, will allow some of this to come out in the Q&A. Well, I want to thank Neil and the Program for Pub and Public Law for having this and having me and, and Guy for his thoughtful comments. Um, you I said that last night. <laughs> well, I, I put up with you for 45 <laughs> minutes. I, obviously, I thought it was pretty good. Um, so, and I, and I think actually our discussion was better than the paper, so I'm a little worried about that. Um, I started out thinking about this because I didn't think that this was an easy question, or I thought the, the, the sense in which it's an easy question is, is problematic, the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And a lot of my students are here, and they know that I, you know, if I have a gift as a teacher, which is debatable, it's probably the gift for taking what ought to be an easy question and making it hard and confusing. So that, that's kind of what's going on here. Um, I think this, this question of under, under enforcement, though, is a pervasive one in constitutional law, and this, this particular statute raises a, an interesting instance of it. Let, let me talk first about the gap between meaning and doctrine, because I think he's exactly right that, that the idea that you're under enforcing presupposes that there is something that you could enforce more, that there's a there there in, in a sense. So, so the first question here is, what is the meaning of a constitutional provision if it's under enforced? Um, and I think there's a couple of issues there. The first is whether there is a single meaning of constitutional provisions. And I think that's a clause-specific question. I don't think there's necessarily a right answer to what every single clause of the Constitution means. There are some clauses. So you have to be 35 years old to be president. And, and although my friend Sandy Levinson has argued that you know, that could mean 23 if you think of it in base six, you know, you know, so there's not one meaning there, I think that's highly implausible. I think there are easy cases in constitutional law. But I, th I think I am willing to to admit that there are other provisions of the Constitution where there's a zone of reasonable meaning, so it would and not necessarily one right answer there. 
Um, for many principles, that's true, and I think federalism is probably one of them. I think there's a zone. But I think under enforcement can still occur, and we can still identify it as such, even if we concede that there might not be one right meaning for that constitutional principle. You could concede that there's a gray area and still think that the current doctrine happens to exist outside of the gray area. Um, and I think that's true of federalism. Um, I think others may disagree. Um, I think the, you know, the zone of reasonable readings would, would be something like the, the zone of ways that you could interpret Justice Marshall's opinion in Gibbons v. Ogden, where you know, I, th I think he says three crucial things in Gibbons v. Ogden. One is that enumeration presupposes something not enumerated, so there must be something that the, the federal government can't do. That's Justice O'Connor's question from Lopez. Um, that that should be defined to be a meaningful set of things. I think that's implicit in the way that he talks about the zone of what's not enumerated in, in Gibbons. Um, and it also has to be enforced by courts. I mean, he's very clear that the political safeguards operate within the sphere of things that are within Congress's jurisdiction, but it falls to the courts to police the outer boundaries of that jurisdiction. So I think that, you know, if you're going to push me to, to develop a core of, of what I think the federalism provisions of the Constitution means, it, it would be something like that. But, but I think the second aspect of this core meaning question is, do you have to agree on what that core meaning is to, to identify the problem of under, under enforcement and to suggest that courts maybe should tighten up enforcement? And I think the answer to that is often going to be no. You might say something as vague about federalism as that it's some norm of balance. Um, and if it's some norm balanced between the national government and the states, then you might be pressed to identify, well, what is the, the optimal point of that balance? And I think you don't necessarily have to know that. You have to know which direction things need to move in. You have to know which direction the system is out of whack in, because that would be the, the direction that doctrine probably ought to push back against. And I think there are so many constraints on the ability of courts to push very far on these issues, given the sheer institutional weight of the federal government, that they're unlikely to take us past that point of, of, of optimal meaning. And so as long as you know that the general direction we need to hike is north, um, I don't think you necessarily need to know how far exactly we'd like to go, because we know that we're never going to get there. So that's, that's what I have to see about um, core meaning. Now, what about you know, whether under enforcement or, or popular constitutionalism necessarily leads to judicial review? And I think it doesn't necessarily. I, I think there, and, and here I'm treading into things that probably ought to be more in the paper that, that aren't quite yet. Um, but I think you know, we talked this morning about the use of federalism principles to vindicate a particular view of individual economic liberty and whether that was important. But I think there's two ways that, fed that federalism principles tie into the popular constitutionalism dynamic here. One is the role of the states as advocates here. Um, and that's independent of the result. You know, they may very well lose, they may lose spectacularly, right? Um, but I think they've played an important role in articulating this different vision. And, and if you articulate a different vision, you know, sometimes that gets picked up you know, at, at the end of the day, and that's how the Constitution changes in many ways. And I think there's particular advantages to states as actors in that kind of process. You know, there's a lot of criticism, for instance, of the Tea Party that maybe it's backed by shadowy corporate interests and, and not accountable to anyone, things like that. States are great by comparison, right? You gotta elect states. They have all sorts of, of constitutional, statutory, and political constraints on their actions. So for instance, there was a considerable debate in the 2010 primary for the election for um, Attorney General of Texas about whether participation in some of these kinds of lawsuits was an appropriate thing for the state of Texas to be involved in. There was a political debate in the context of an election, right? We don't get that kind of accountability in litigation for the most part, or in you know, non-governmental organizations leading social movements. So I think that's, that's really um, a pretty good thing. Um, and the states, you know, when, they, when they contest norms in this way, they can do it through a lot of avenues. One is by litigation, but another is through electoral politics. Um, and yet another is through the administration of these Federal, of, of these federal regimes. So Heather Gerken has written about uncooperative federalism, about the way that states push back against the implementation of federal mandates. And I think you're going to see a lot of pushback from the states in the actual on-the-ground implementation of the Affordable Care Act. It's already <laughs> happening. It's already narrowed it. So, so this is, you know, these suits are just one way in which the states are, are engaged in this. But I think the second point does lead to judicial review, and that is that if you vindicate the under-enforced norm 
of economic liberty through a federalism holding. What that does, and I made this point this morning, is it creates a, an institutional space to try out different visions of economic liberty in different jurisdictions. So, so Massachusetts may decide to just go ahead and adopt socialism, while you know, Texas may decide that people don't really need insurance, insurance is for weenies, right? So you, you're going to get quite different pictures of, of individual rights. And that's one thing that federalism is designed to promote. It, when, we, when we have aspects of individual liberties that we don't agree on as a national society, if you limit the power of the federal government to intervene on these questions, then that allows popular constitutionalism to take place in the states and, and maybe develop that conversation further. Thank you, Ernie. Neil Siegel. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to mention two, uh, two, two comments in response to Ernie's paper, and then I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, Brian Leach's paper. Uh, I think I think he asked the right question, right? Which is that under enforcement presupposes something that's being under enforced. I didn't hear a lot of what Ernie said that persuades me that that that, that he has an answer for the question, right? So it's not whether the Constitution has one meaning or whether there is a gray area. Um, it's 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 what is the core content of constitutional federalism of the appropriate division of power between the federal government and the states that you think is being under enforced and ought to be enforced more. Right? So in my work with Bob Cooter, I proposed, I proposed collective action federalism to identify what the federal government is particularly good at doing, what the states are not. Um, I don't think it's enough to say that there's lots of different possible answers or that we should move north as much as possible, by which I take you to mean restrict federal power as much as possible because we know we're never going to do it all that much anyway. Um, you know, um, smaller is better as much as we can get away with in the world in which we're living. Again, I, I don't see an account of constitutional federalism that 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 the under enforcement uh, is actually being uh, is is with respect to uh, the other the, the other thought I had and this is really more in the paper than in the comments today is you're wondering about whether we're at where a certain political moment or political point in which social movement advocacy popular constitutionalism can succeed in changing the content of constitutional law and I applaud Ernie's move in trying to bring popular constitutionalism into the debate because I think it allows him to both try and preserve the law politics distinction as well as unsettle it by thinking about the processes of constitutional change. But, but, but I, th I think a lot of questions, a lot of empirical questions need to be answered right, before we're going to be persuaded that the losers in this particular legislative fight actually ought to win in the courts. How, uh, how much of a case can one make that Tea Party politics is here to stay in an enduring way that's going to persuade a majority of Americans? How many Americans believe that the debt ceiling should not have been raised? They, they believe that there should only be spending cuts and not tax increases. Who do, the American, what is, who do the American people look to to fix a broken economy, to create jobs? Who does the American public hold responsible right, for a bad economy? What happens when conservatives start talking seriously about cutting back on the social safety net, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? Right? So it seems to me that a lot more would need to be established before we're talking about a social movement of the order of past social movements that would change the content of constitutional law. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen, right? It could happen, um, uh, but, but, but I don't think the case has been made. All right, Brian Leach, where law meets politics, freedom of contract, federalism, and the fight over health care. Brian's a third year law student here at Duke Law School. Uh, this paper earned him the student writing prize, which the faculty typically awards at the end of each academic year during a special graduation ceremony. Uh, this was not impossible to do in Brian's case because Brian won the award as a 2L. And I've since assigned this paper in, in a seminar on the constitutional law and politics of health care uh, reform. It's forthcoming in the Journal of Law and Politics. I commend it to you. Uh, Brian's paper uses the controversy over the ACA to explore the boundary between constitutional politics and constitutional law, I think in much the way that Ernie's paper does, uh, a boundary that Brian views as both real on the one hand and ragged on the other. And sometimes, as in the case of the ACA, both in the very same litigation. Uh, Brian's paper centers on instances in which political commitments succeed or fail at being translated into the sort of constitutional arguments that legal practitioners are prepared to take seriously lawyers, judges, legal academics. Uh, the central claim of the paper is that opponents of the individual mandate in the ACA are using, with a significant degree of success so far, the US Supreme Court's contemporary federalism doctrine to vindicate their deeply felt commitments to economic liberty. 
early on in the constitutional debate over health care reform, when it started moving from the Congress to the courts, Bryan perceived that the litigants challenging the constitutionality of the mandate were using arguments ostensibly sounding in constitutional federalism to legitimate a Lochner-style commitment to freedom of contract, or more precisely, freedom from contract, uh, as well as laissez-faire opposition to redistributive economic regulations. I think the fight over the ACA is very much a fight over economic redistribution by government. As Brian notes in the paper, the core constitutional objection to the individual mandate is its supposed economic conscription of quote unquote inactive individuals. This objection formed the basis of both a substantive due process challenge and a commerce clause challenge at the district court level. And Brian focuses on this objection, identifying points of divergence between constitutional politics and constitutional law, as well as points of convergence between the two realms. So on the one hand, Brian observes, courts have dismissed, dismissed opponents' substantive due process claim on the ground that the ACA doesn't implicate a presently recognized so-called fundamental right, and that there was a rational basis, which is all that's required in the absence of a of heightened scrutiny for, for Congress's conclusion that the minimum coverage provision is essential to effectuate the ACA provisions banning the underwriting practices of insurance companies. And in this way, according to the paper, uh, the episode reveals the distinction, the partial separation of constitutional politics and constitutional law. Economic substantive due process claims lack threshold legal plausibility anymore. Law is disciplining politics. The boundary between the two realms is real and stands firm. On the other hand, uh, some of the very same courts are vindicating the very same objection to economic conscription by holding that the mandates beyond the scope of Congress's enumerated powers. Here, political commitments to economic liberty are finding a basis for constitutional legitimation in federalism jurisprudence. And in this way, according to Brian, the episode reveals the partial susceptibility of constitutional law to political influence. The scope of the Commerce Clause, at least for some courts so far, is being reimagined as vindicating values that used to protect economic substantive, used to be protected by economic substantive due process. So politics is reshaping law. The boundary between politics and law is ragged and blurred. A question. Uh, uh, two questions I'll, I'll mention and then, then I'll stop. The first, and this is really a question for both authors, to what extent is this a separate conversation from the morning's conversations about the merits, right? Is this a discussion only about the processes of constitutional change, which is properly held from the external point of view, the analyst of the constitutional system, or is this also a discussion that's relevant to how the merits ought to be adjudicated from the internal perspective of the judge? And then secondly, what are we to make of the prominent legal conservatives who have deemed unpersuasive the federalism objections to the individual mandate. I'm thinking of Judge Jeff Sutton on the Sixth Circuit, Professor Charles Freed, who has no patience for the arguments of opponents of the individual mandate, um, uh, folks like Orrin Kerr, who believe that on the, uh, under current law, the mandate is plainly constitutional. Uh, are these responses, uh, these different responses revealing different types of legal conservatives? And if so, are there different types of legal liberals? Um, and where are they? Thank you, Brian. Uh, well, first, I want to thank Professor Siegel for uh, asking me to participate in this event. Uh, I'm a great admirer of all the contributors here today, so this is a uh, real honor for me to get to be a part of this. Um, so I'll, I'll, tr I'll attempt to answer Professor Siegel's question um, by answering the, uh, the general thrust of it, which I, which I take to be similar to Professor Charles' question, essentially. Uh, what work is popular constitutionalism doing here in understanding this um, litigation and understanding this episode more generally? Um, I, think, I, I, I think of three things that I think are, are instructive with popular constitutionalism in this episode. The first is it provides at least some framing function. Um, and this goes to, I think, Professor, uh, Professor Sachs's comments from this morning in terms of uh, what are we doing here if this is an easy question? And what are we doing here if this is simply about a narrow legal dispute about the, uh, about Article One, Section Eight of the United States Constitution, which is is the the the, the, the dispute in and of itself, the divorce from popular constitutionalism, I think, essentially goes something like this: The Congress passed a federal law. States and individuals brought a legal challenge to that law. Some courts have found for the plaintiffs, and some courts have found for the government. And I think, absent the dimension, the extra dimension of what is happening in the political and social background, I think that's. Uh, there may be more to it than that, but I don't know how much more there is to it than that. Um, and so I think what it does is it allows, it allows uh, people to have a framework 
allows people to put the social, um, the social context and the political dispute at least into a constitutional box, that we can put this somewhere. And, uh, and this is somewhat, uh, I think, a point where Professor Young and I might diverge in terms of how determinate the, uh, the liberty claims need to be. I don't know necessarily that I have an opinion on how determinate they need to be, but I think at least putting them into some sort of box is instructive. Uh, second, I think that it serves a, a really valuable, uh, a valuative function in looking at this dispute. And uh, for, for a long time, anyone who has studied constitutional law knows that substantive due process and Lochner Court federalism ideas were essentially overdetermined constitutional fallacies that were taken to be true regardless of articulating justifications for their dismissal. And I think that this debate, in a lot of ways, if you look at it through popular constitutionalism and, bring, and put these claims into a constitutional box, it has in some ways forced the legal community to have a reasoned debate about whether or not the reasons justifying Lochner's dismissal are still good reasons, or whether or not those values are something that we should find in constitutional law or should have some enforcement in constitutional law. Um, and I think that even if there's no change, ultimately, in doctrine, I think having that kind of, that kind of debate uh, is, a, is an immensely productive enterprise. Um, so I think that's, that's the second thing. The third thing is that I think it, it can have an explanatory function in regard to non-doctrinal aspects of judicial opinions rendered on this decision so far. Uh, and I think it explains, in some ways, the ways in which different courts have engaged with the constitutional facts in this case. And the, and the primary constitutional fact, I think, in this case is obviously the individual mandate, what it says, what it does, and what it means. Um, there are vastly different descriptions of that vastly different accounts provided by different courts on what, that, um, on what the law says and what it does. And I'll quote directly first from the 11th Circuit opinion. The mandate, uh, it, it requires individuals to enter into contracts with private insurance companies for the purchase of an expensive product from the time they are born until the time they die. The 6th Circuit, particularly Judge Sutton's concurrence says, the mandate does not compel individuals to buy insurance or even use insurance. They may pay a penalty instead, which in the first several years of the act, if not throughout its existence, normally will cost less than medical insurance. Now that sounds as if they are describing two different laws. Um, and I don't think it's simply a matter of one court is reading the law correctly and one court is not. Uh, I don't think it's uh, that simple of a question. They're all brilliant judges deciding a very difficult constitutional question in good faith. Um, and I don't think that that description necessarily, that the rhetorical distinction is outcome determinative, but I do think it, there's a descriptive divergence there that matters, and I think it matters in this sense that it, it, it suggests, at least in some instances, that um, the ways in which judges, I'm quoting Professor Siegel here, the ways in which judges go about accounting for the conditions of their own legitimacy is informed by the social meaning of constitutional facts. And I think the social meaning of the individual mandate, uh, as expressed in the Eleventh Circuit, is very much, um, it, it at least in some ways aligns with the opponent's view of it, as if this is, regardless of the it, it, the, the Eleventh Circuit, in, in a lot of ways, is engaging with the law at a very symbolic level in terms of what its social meaning is, in terms of what it symbolizes as, a, as an exercise of national authority. And I think that it's difficult. I, I'm sure there are other ways to account for that distinction, but I think that is, it can be one useful way in accounting for um, the, the, the sort of descriptive divergence between the two courts. And I think in a lot of ways it also, um, earlier this morning, Dean Levy noted that uh, his, his view that the adversarial process itself tends to neutralize the law and politics convergence. And I think that there's evidence certainly of that, and I think that certainly his opinion on that matter I would, I would take very seriously. Um, but I think that there's also evidence that, and he pointed to the, part of what neutralizes the law of politics convergence in the judicial function is that uh, there's this norm of reason giving. There's, there's an explanatory uh, duty upon judges to explain the reasons for their decision. And in some ways, that does neutralize the, the constitutional aspect, the constitutional politics aspect of it. But in some ways, it also um, activates the constitutional politics. And I'll point to Judge Sutton's concurrence, where a page later, after describing the mandate as not compelling insurance, he says uh, he addresses what he calls the political intuitions surrounding the individual mandate. And he says that those are just that. Sometimes an intuition is just an intuition. And so I think that in providing reasons for his decision, uh, in, in essentially the, 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 mechanism for, f the mechanism by which judges neutralize the law of politics convergence and at the same time activates the law of politics convergence. The judges have to account for the conditions of their own legitimacy in the midst of a uh, largely uh, 
a potentially intractable political dispute about the social meaning of uh, exercise of national authority over the individual and, and uh, the deeply felt liberty commitments of the uh, opponents of the individual mandate. Thank you so much, Brian. Check. Okay. Um, I thought what I would do is just talk about popular constitutionalism. Um, if you're going to talk about popular constitutionalism in constitutional theory, you need both a positive account and a normative account of it. Um, so I'm going to give up both a positive and normative account of it in the hope that it might be useful both, uh, to both papers. Um, so the normative account is why any why uh, the lawmaking institutions, in particular the judiciary, should care at all about what uh, social movements, political parties, uh, or popular mobilizations say about the Constitution. So that's the normative question. Uh, my view on this is very clear. Judges have absolutely no obligation to pay any attention to any social movements. Uh, they can scream all day long if they want. The judges have no obligation to listen to them. Let me say that again. It doesn't matter whether there are huge amounts of popular mobilizations outside your door. Judges have no obligation. So if you want to give an account of popular constitutionalism, you're going to have to start instead with the positive theory. The positive theory is a theory that gives an account of how various mechanisms in civil society ultimately affect decision making by judges and by the political branches. And then you could make a normative case based on how these mechanisms promote the democratic legitimacy of the entire system of constitutional development. But the simple circuit between people yelling and screaming in public or people forming committees and judicial behavior is not going to work. It's not going to work because there are always millions of social movements going on at any one point. And, there's, and so which ones are the judges supposed to listen to? Which one do they have authority to listen to? They have no authority to listen to either. Rather, you have to back up and you have to ask, if you think popular constitutionalism is an important feature of American constitutional development, which I do, and I've written about it in great deal, you have to give a fleshed out account of how it actually works in practice. And that means you have to pay some attention to institutions. In particular, you have to pay attention to the role of political parties and how political parties serve as the vehicles for the articulation of constitutional grievances and, and as, as Brian was talking about, constitutional meaning. So parties play an incredibly important role in what people call uh, constitution, but parties are led by elites. And so a lot of what actually is popular constitutionalism is a relationship between elite actors and, uh, claiming to speak in the name of the people. Then you have to think about issues such as how is constitutional culture created? A constitutional culture is the social meanings, to use Brian's idea, that people have about the meaning of the Constitution. Well, how is that meaning created? It's created through mass media. It's created, like Fox News, for example. It's created, also run by various elites. It's also created by think tanks and, and uh, academic conferences and in the classroom. Uh, so what we're doing right here is engaging in the formation and reproduction of constitutional culture over time. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, the America, People for the American Way, all these civil society organizations have developed in the 20th century and now the 21st century play an incredibly important role in the production of constitutional culture. It also is part of electoral politics. Constitutional culture is generated through electoral politics. For example, the Republican primaries right now are thick with allusions to meanings about constitutional meanings. And candidates try to make our, uh, claims based on the Constitution in order to please certain kinds of constituencies. Those things have an effect over the long run. Uh, then you have to think about uh, classical interest groups, telecommunications industry, healthcare industry, uh, all of whom participate in trying to articulate constitutional meanings. Uh, and then finally, classical social movements um, of the kind we associate with the civil rights movement, right? But these also have their elite components uh, in terms of, for example, public interest groups that bring claims before the courts. Uh, Charles Epps' work on, and Steve Tellis's work uh, shows you that it's not enough to have popular discontent or grievance. You actually have to have uh, infrastructure in civil society to bring claims before the courts. Epps, a classic example is women's rights, in which the, as the court became more conservative, it became more open to women's rights claims. What, why, why is that? Epps says the reason has nothing to do with the placement of judges on the courts, but rather with the fact that you had civil society organizations creating an infrastructure for litigation. 
So if you were going to under talk about popular constitutionalism and you were going to talk about its effect on the uh, Affordable Care Act, you would have to begin by identifying the relevant actors, starting with Fox News, with the American, uh, the American Justice Institute, various right-wing think tanks and right-wing uh, public uh, litigation groups. You'd have to talk about the way in which uh, candidates for public office find it important to make constitutional claims to their constituents in order to please them and gain power. You'd have to talk about the role of various elites uh, uh, in society and how they affect popular claims. You'd have to then you'd have to talk about the relationship between grassroots organizations and these elite organizations, the role and uh, the role of politicians in making claims. And then finally, you would have to talk about a 40-year conservative movement, which has succeeded in placing people on the federal bench. Uh, largely by party identification. And another a key factor in popular constitutionalism is a process that Sandy Levinson and I have called partisan entrenchment, in which uh, politicians try to place their confreres on the federal bench uh, with the idea that many years later, or shortly, or thereafter, they'll get enough other fellow confreres on the bench to finally affect change in constitution. So once you start to lay out the institutional fabric here that we're talking about, what, what people loosely call popular constitutionalism isn't very popular at all. Or rather, it's popular plus civil society, plus political parties, plus elites, plus media, plus civil society, elite organizations, plus litigation infrastructure, and all that. Now, if you wanted to tell the story of the uh, ACA, it would be a story of all of these different people working together, or sometimes working across purposes, to create a possibility where things that were previously considered off the wall, that is lunatic, crazy, you know, not professionally sound, move to on the wall, that is plausible. So the fact that this conference is being held right now, at this moment, is a tribute, not simply to the bare plausibility or implausibility of ideas, or pure logic, it's rather due to a sustained effort at mobilization at various parts in society to change people's notions of what's off the wall and on the wall. And the most important thing to understand about the effect of these institutions is that they have succeeded in changing constitutional understandings so that the debate over uh, the Affordable Care Act is now a live debate. Now, People like me or like Irwin may, may you know, protest up and down about how it's just a slam dunk case. Couldn't be simpler. But if you understand how constitutional meaning and constitutional actually changes, you have to understand that it's not enough for us simply to say it. We have to participate in various institutions in order to preserve particular sets of constitutional meanings. If we don't do so, then other groups competing with us will attempt to change constitutional culture. And the very fact of this conference is a demonstration of the success of these various institutions in sufficiently changing constitutional culture that, in fact, it's a live controversy. Now, whether it means that it will move from the plausible to successful depends on something else which is central to the notion of, political, of popular constitutionalism. It is a mistake, by the way. Uh, one, one little bone I do have to pick about um, Ernie's paper is he confuses popular constitution with states. When states get involved in litigation, they may or may not be part of the processes of, constitutional, of popular constitutionalism. But their presence in and of itself is not what we would call popular constitutionalism. On the other hand, many forms of popular constitutionalism have begun in states. The gay rights movement is a classic example. The civil rights movement for black equality is another example. The women's rights movement. All of these have begun in states and were recognized first at state levels. If that's what you mean, I'm totally on your side. If the, however, if the idea that 28 uh, uh, attorney generals would get together and sue in Florida is popular constitutionalism, that's a mistake. That's not what popular constitutionalism is. That's 28 state attorney generals. Um, but the fact that they're all, almost all from the Republican Party and tied in a move of conservatism, that's popular constitutionalism. Because basically they are part of the elite uh, mechanisms or elite infrastructure which is tying together a social movement to the possibility of constitutional change. And that leads to the last point. The fact that this idea is now plausible, right? And by the way, you have to understand that you can't understand this debate against, uh, against the background of the debate over the debt ceiling. They are actually part of the same mobilization. Uh, they're part of the same idea, and the fight that's going to be coming up at the end of next month over 
uh, over the uh, government shutdown, over another, we'll have another appropriations bill. These are all part of the next wave of a 40-year movement for conservative mobilization, which has had many different features. And in each time, this mobilization has tried to fundamentally change the social contract, and each time it has been beaten back. It tried with Reagan administration, and then it tried again in 94, and then it tried again with the George W. Bush administration, and now it's trying again. And so this is, a, this is people trying for a very long time to fundamentally change the nature of the social contract. And the basic lesson you have to understand about popular constitutionalism, it doesn't happen overnight. This could be a successful mobilization. It could change the fundamental nature of the social contract. It could be a, a move away from a redistributed state and the liberal conception of the perfection of the social welfare state. It could be all those things. It could be a renewal of federalism. But it might not succeed. A lot has to go right in order for it to succeed. The, mo the mobilization that begins in 1870 in the Grange that ultimately leads to the New Deal takes basically 60 years and is continuously beaten back. We don't know whether the story of this mobilization is the same as that or whether it's a completely different story. Thank you, Jack. So, Ted, um, we'll have us 10 minutes and then we will have another round. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you, Neil, for organizing a spectacular conference. Um, I agree with about 90% uh, of the, the basic propositions in the two papers about the operation of, of judicialized constitutional law in, in broader context. Um, and I agree with about 90% of the comments from my other commenters on that vein. And I agree with 100% of what I'm about to say in an hour <laughs> on a similar theme of the broader con contextual. So I'll spend my 10 minutes on my sort of one minute per percent disagreement. Um, and first, two, these are two tremendous papers. Um, Brian, I commend you on, on this very nuanced treatment of uh, the way that the politics of, of opposition to the individual mandate have inflected the judicial consideration here. Um, what I want to suggest to you and um, make a few points is, is about um, the way in which not just your characterization and your focus on the Tea Party, but indeed other papers, other folks who talked this morning, occasionally other stuff that com comes up in the context of this particular litigation, I think somewhat mischaracterizes the shape of the popular opposition to the individual mandate. I think it's wider than the Tea Party. I'll explain why. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's both wider and then, then it's shallower than kind of a deep Lochnerian libertarian objection in the sense that some people have characterized it. It's wider simply because many more Americans object to the individual mandate than are members of the Tea Party, okay? Polling data shows as high as 70% disagreement with the individual mandate. Other polls show 55 to 60% of Americans disagree with the mandate. Candidate, candidate Barack Obama disagreed with the mandate and distanced himself in the Democratic primary voters, to the Democratic primary voters from Hillary Clinton on this ground. So this invokes something much broader than just uh, Tea Party, uh, the Tea Party, whatever you think of the Tea Party. Um, and in that sense, we, here we have the first irony, in a sense, going now referring to Ernie's paper about the uh, judicial under-enforcement and the difficulty of matching the tool of judicial enforcement, namely this imperfect thing called ju judicial doctrine, to the underlying values or norms. There here is a mismatch, um, there's an interesting mismatch in popular opposition to the mandate and, um, and uh, the, the doctrinalized form. Some sophisticated polling by David Ash and colleagues at Penn have shown that opposition to the mandate is highest among Americans when you portray it as government in incursion on the free choice to buy or not to buy insurance. So if you mention choice and, and people's choices in the healthcare market, you get higher levels of disagreement than just kind of a, a regulation or a penalty on just doing nothing, okay? Now, obviously, here we have the doctrinal form for the opponents of the mandate has to almost invert that and say, it's not a choice whether to buy or not buy insurance. Instead, this is regulation of inaction. So this is one of many ways that I'll mention in the next few minutes where the doctrine doesn't match up with the underlying popular norms. Um, so, if, so the opposition to the mandate is broader than the Tea Party. It's also, however, shallower than a claim that this is uh, deep anti-statism, deep libertarianism, even among so many Tea Party members, I think. Because polls also show, and political behavior also shows, that Americans are indeed quite happy with parts of the ACA that interfere with free market power of private insurers um, and, and, uh, and, and other 
kind of private ordering solution. So the most popular, garnering approval ratings of 70 to 80 percent when disaggregated in polls, are provisions that prevent actuarial underwriting accuracy of, of age and health, that prevent uh, insurance companies from using market power to exclude people with pre-existing conditions. So what we have is a more complex picture where most Americans don't like the mandate because of its incursions on freedom of choice vis-a-vis -vis healthcare matters, but they're very solicitous of government interventions to protect freedom of choice for them and their doctor against free market private ordering. This is a topic we'll talk more about later this afternoon, but I think to say anti-statism is too strong there. In this sense, my favorite statement from um, from Tea Party rallies uh, is one that's not in your paper, um, Brian. It's one that people like to mock, but I think has something to it. It's when they say, keep the government out of my Medicare. And we say, oh, but Medicare is a government program. But you know what? The Tea Party, that statement accurately embodies the political compromise that and operation of Medicare over the last 50 years, that it's a blank check from government. It pays for medical care, but until very recently, it has not imposed any government uh, barrier on physician-patient discretion, which is part of the cost problem we're in. So to say, keep the government out of my Medicare is actually a fairly apt description of the way the program has worked. Um, and that, I think, embodies the broader public misgiving is against government or private restraint on traditional medical autonomy, not anti-statism so much as anti-corporatism, whether that collective corporate judgment is exercised by a government federal or state, or by a managed care company or hospital or accountable care organization. And again, we'll talk more about that later. Um, so Brian, I, I just I would encourage you to think more about that broader shape of the popular opposition to the mandate. That said, I think your paper persuades me that it is this, the narrower Lochnerian Tea Party strain that appears to be transmitting to the courts, which is interesting in and of itself. And there, there seems to be a more direct pathway there. Now, um, moving sort of well, applies to both papers, but moving more specifically um, to Ernie's wonderfully nuanced paper about the kind of um, different ways our constitutional order is framed by different institutions using different tools in ways that don't always match up. Um, I, Ernie, you, you talk very aptly, I think, about the imperfections of doctrine as a tool for judicial enforcement of core meaning. And, you know, we're kind of stuck to a certain extent due to stare decisis, we're stuck with the doctrine we have. Even if we agree that doctrine is more malleable, we're stuck with the kind of ability of ver verbal formulations administrable by courts to capture some value. So there's a real limitation there generally. I think this litigation and this clash is particularly highlights and is characterized particularly by inapt and, uh, and a kind of paucity of helpful constitutional doctrine. Part of that is the way both papers and many people talk about the fact that, and many people say, this is, this is really not about federalism, it's about individual liberty. And that's a consistent descriptive claim about this litigation. You, and so you, you have to start, kind of ask, if, if everybody thinks this is about something else than what we're arguing about in our briefs, doesn't that suggest that there's a poverty of uh, vernacular, of vocabulary, of kind of doctrinal form to argue about the important issues here? And I think that clearly exists on the mandate which is really viewed uh, by people as an incursion into individual choice, but has to be litigated because there's, you know, has to be litigated as a technical commerce clause case. It's also true, something that Ernie, you also mentioned in your paper, vis-a-vis um, -vis this mismatch of judicial doctrine and constitutional problem. It also occurs vis-a-vis -vis what the, uh, it also applies to the, the ACA's real federalism shift which is the spending clause burden on the states and having them set up these exchanges and administer them, expand Medicaid and administer that. I mean, this is a, this is a huge imposition by the federal government on the states. Um, but doctrinally, it's a no-brainer, okay, that they've, you know, under South Dakota versus Dole and, and uh, correlate uh, spending clause cases, that's not the question we're talking about when that arguably is the real federalism question of the act. And again, I think we'll say more in the afternoon panel a bit about that. So this is a, it's a nice case study, Ernie, I think, for your general theory, because we might expect judicial under enforcement, perhaps in an area where the, the constitutional doctrine, the tools the courts have to work with, are so poor. Um, last point, and leveraging um, Guy on something you said, when, when you talk about under enforcement or over enforcement, we, would have, we might ask, what's the baseline? Um, we might look to some kind of pure or centralized constitutional form. 
Um, I would look in also to, and for, uh, for myself primarily, to other institutions, whether it be the public or the movements that Jack talks about, or the political parties, or in, in this case, other institutions like Congress and the executive branch. And this, without getting too much into the topic of the next panel, um, my study of congressional behavior in the healthcare context over the past 200 years in the, has suggested a real reluctance for Congress to impose strong form rules on the practice of medicine or the ordering of medical care in the states. Um, the ACA is a mild change to that, but it comes after a century of failed efforts to enact national health reform. It comes after a half century of federal spending interventions, Medicare and Medicaid, which subsidize but don't control or standardize medical care. So the government acts as uh, the writer of checks rather than the regulator of primary medical care. Um, so what we have here is a legislative constitutionalism, which I would say over enforces concerns about incursion on state authority and has done so for two centuries. And I, 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 when I say over enforce, I actually don't mean that here as a normative knock on Congress, although I kind of do. I mean it though more precisely as over enforcement relative to the constitutional baseline of doctrinal Commerce Clause law, whether it be 1860, when the, 1880, when the Supreme Court said, we would welcome a national uh, quarantine law. Go ahead, Congress, do it. We think your concerns about, this is quoted in my other paper, um, we think your concerns are over enforcing, um, or whether it be through the second half of the 20th century as the federal government regulated other areas of economic life, but had stayed out of regulating um, the provision of medical care and the practice of medicine. To put that last point, to, to put it in, in the constitutional ver vernacular, what we have here is Congress doing something that we would say judges haven't done really since the 1920s, which, in, which it, Congress, through much more of the 20th century, engaged in what I would call a kind of bumpy or categorical application of the reach of the commerce power. So we now think judicially the commerce power is plenary. It reaches, if it reaches far enough, it reaches all the ac economic activity with enough free rider problems or with, you know, it doesn't pick and choose categorically between industries. Well, Congress in, its, in the path of its 20th century regulation has picked and choose between indus industries and has, has regulated other forms of economic activity much more rigorously than healthcare. Just to put flesh on that, for somebody walking through a hospital, you would encounter a lot of federal regulation at the door in the form of EMTALA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, you'd, you'd, you'd encounter privacy regulation when you check in with HIPAA. The least, the zone where you'd find the least federal regulation is in the room where patient care is provided. And that, so there's a kind of dis and incongruity there. Um, my time is up. And um, I'm, I'm the one who tells you when I went over. Yes, okay. Um, my time is up and, and I would just say, Ernie, to, to you know, this, I agree with the, 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 the frame of, of constitutional operation that your paper suggests. I would just add that in this particular case, we, I would argue that we have over enforcement of state sovereignty concerns from Congress through much of the 20th century, and the ACA should be viewed in the context of that path. All right, let's start with some quick fire responses from the panelists, and then we'll bring some of you in. I know, Ernie, that you, okay. you, want, you want to get so, back at your uh, <coughs> tormentors. Just, just a couple things in response to Ted. I, I mean, I, I think the, the federal administrative state is racist to look what are on, on whether there's over enforcement of state sovereignty. Um, and I, I think that's a, a response to Neil as well. I mean, it, it's, it's true that this paper doesn't develop a complete theory of federalism. Um, I, I did that in another paper, or tried to, and nobody read it because it was too long. Um, the other <laughs> thing, about, everyone else seems more worried than I am about the mismatch between federalism concerns and individual rights concerns. I, I guess the, the only thing additional I would say is that I've never met anybody besides me who cares about federalism for its own sake. I mean, I basically have no policy views, but, but everybody else cares about federalism because they don't like something on the merits that the, gov that the federal government is doing. But that doesn't mean that it's inappropriate to use federalism to prevent that from coming about. Um, in response to Jack, I'm just not sure that popular constitutionalism is a crisp enough analytic concept that one can say one is mistaken um, to put it in a particular way. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that the states are doing two things with these lawsuits, not one. I'm sure they hope to win on the merits. Maybe they will, you know, but probably not. 
But they're also trying to articulate a vision of the Constitution. It happens to be written in a complaint rather than a resolution or a pamphlet, but that's what it's doing. It's participating in the process of popular constitutionalism in much the same way that the, the states of Virginia and Kentucky participated in a discourse about the meaning of the Constitution in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Um, those didn't have any positive legal effect. The fact that they came from states as institutions gave them some weight, but it was as participating you know, in, in, in a broader discourse. And popular constitutional has lots of institutions that participate, churches, NGOs, class actions, private companies. But I think we've neglected the role of states as, as inputs to that process. Um, I also think we've neglected the role of courts. I think a lot of people changed their mind about whether this was an off-the-wall argument when the 11th Circuit wrote a 200-page opinion articulating why this might be a view of the Constitution. And even if it's overruled, I think that puts it on the map or on the wall, as it, as it were. In much the same way that the dissents in the, in the cases striking down New Deal legislation put the possibility that the federal government could act in this way on the wall, and then FDR picks up on that in his fireside chat and says, look, you know, there are smart judges that believe that the Constitution permits that. So I think there's a feedback loop in popular constitutionalism that includes courts. That said, I don't think anybody's making a simple claim that there's just a direct circuit from popular movements to the courts. That's, that's not the claim. The central claim of the paper is very narrow, that this case is, is considered easy only because of under-enforcement, that under-enforcement is different from actual constitutional meaning, and that the degree of under enforcement changes over time and has something to do with what's going on now out in the country. I'm not going to try to get too far into institutionally how that happens. I'm a doctrine guy. I'm going to leave that to the Yaleys. Right. Brian. Uh, well, I, if you like. yes, I, I just actually do have a couple of questions for Professor Ruber. Um, and uh, so there seems to be, uh, there's been more literature on, on the sort of the, the claims made uh, in the political sphere and in sort of polling data that I, I definitely would be interested in, in, in seeing and, and discussing that with you. Um, I'm curious if your, um, if in your interpretation of, of the larger dispute uh, and its breadth, if, if it's possible to, um, if, if the sort of uh, identity crisis that you identified with the, with the Tea Party slogan of, of keep the government out of my Medicaid or Medicare, um, whether or not that's, that's evident, um, that the evidence of, of the process of resolving an identity defining conflict in a sense, of the sense that this is a crisis of identity at a national level in terms of people's understanding of how they relate to the national government. And then there are certain um, deeply felt political commitments that are incompatible with certain aspects of, of the, of the uh, current regulatory state. Um, and then second, how much, um, how much of that would you attribute to, uh, Professor Salman wrote an excellent, excellent article uh, about um, uh, critiquing the political safeguards theory, theory of federal, federalism uh, as an empirical matter and whether or not low levels of political aggregate or aggregate political knowledge um, are, are to explain such a statement. And we're using obviously just one, one slogan, but I'm curious if, if you have thoughts on that. Well, first, and I'll, I, there's lots of polling data I can show. There's also an interesting document. It's, an ad, it's a nice adjunct to the Tea Party slogans, which is produced by Frank Luntz called the Lang. He's a more moderate Republican. Holster, who, who did a lot of focus groups on independence about independent voters on what language worked to oppose it. And what works is to say government takeover. What doesn't work is to say things like free market or laissez-faire. And he's got some interesting polling, polling data there. So I think the harder question is, this you mentioned this inconsistency in the way that is there any resolution to it. I think, I don't know that it's resolvable conceptually. I think as a positive descriptive matter, it's something that recurs in American politics. And here, Contrary to, uh, to Jamie's comments here this morning about American exceptionalism, this occurs in Europe, this notion that people want stable government entitlements without meaningful government cost control or reordering of those entitlements. That's happening all over the world, it's ha and it will happen here with respect to health care. But that's, so yes, that's inconsistent, but it's very common, and mm -hmm. it's, America is not exceptional on that regard. Matt, I'd I want to, uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I want to home in on Jack's question about whether there ever should be a direct normative relation between popular constitutionalism and judicial doctrine. Um, now, Jack said something which is intuitively, intuitively very plausible, which is that, you know, whatever the causal impact of popular constitutionalism on 
judicial perceptions of legal legitimacy, however we define popular constitutionalism, judges should just, you know, as a normative matter, ignore it. But I wonder, I mean, something you said earlier, in fact, your, com your question earlier to Neagle, uh, your question earlier to Neil Siegel, um, uh, uh, sorry. You're not the first person to call me that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> legal, legal. Uh, I've, I've got a four-year-old who's done that. <laughs> suggested, uh, and let me say, by the way, indeed, again, to wrap some themes here, the case for judges not taking direct account of popular constitutionalism here would seem particularly strong because, as has been pointed out, what's fueling the popular movements here are liberty concerns, not federal concerns. But your question earlier for Neil suggested maybe a way in which popular constitutionalism might legitimately directly figure in the doctrine, namely this. So imagine a case, you know, forget about Neil, Neil's case or Neil Bob's case, a case in which all states want to regulate and they can't. But your question to Neil was, well, what are the cases in which we have genuine disagreement? Some states want to regulate, some states don't want to regulate. Now, you might say that in that case, well, you know, it's a different sort of case, but that too is a case in which the federal government should regulate as a way to resolve a disagreement, because practically, if some states don't regulate, they're going to attract industry and maybe citizens away from the regulating states, and so that's an exercise of practical constraint on those who want to regulate. But then you might say, we're going to draw an exception to that in the case where the deregulatory states believe that they're not regulating because they're giving force to a constitutional liberty. Right? That is to say, one might want to make an exception from federal power for the case where there's genuine disagreement and, and, and further deregulation is fueled by liberty perceptions. So if that's right, as a matter of normal constitutional doctrine, federalism itself, federalism doctrine itself might incorporate the existence of a popular constitutional movement regarding rights into the structure of the doctrine. I mean, this also relates to over-enforcement and under-enforcement, because one response you might make to me is, well, there's, it's hopeless that judges should actually, as a matter of actual doctrine, look to the existence of you know, a popular constitutional movement fueling deregulation. But maybe that is the real meaning of the underlying federalism doctrine here, which would give to, you know, which, which, which would um, uh, amount to a very nice way in which, as a matter of real meaning, there is this sort of integration of federalism and liberty. That was Dressa. I mean, it's Dressa Jack, but Jack. I think it, you know, it, 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 it implicates themes yes. that everyone else can also. You want to speak on it? Well, start? it's not, the fact that judges have no obligation to listen to what social movements say does not mean that, A, judges don't actually sometimes listen, especially when the movements are allied with the political parties that nominated them, and B, that they might want to do so where they thought that they were convinced by the arguments made. So for example, in uh, Frontiero versus Richardson, uh, Justice Brennan it, it, and Justice White uh, try to convince Justice Powell on the grounds that Congress has just submitted to the states by an overwhelming majority the Equal Rights Amendment. And Powell says, we ought to wait and see what happens to the amendment process. And Brennan and White say, no, we don't have to wait. And White says, the fact that all these people think that women deserve equality to me is, con is conclusive evidence that the Constitution guarantees sex equality. And so that actually influences the way in which the debate goes on in the Supreme Court. Uh, the point I'm making is a very different one. Uh, is that um, Justice White and Justice Brennan had no obligation to do that. That uh, there, it was not required by their role. Um, and if you want to create federalism doctrines which require you to count heads or count noses, like for example in Atkins versus Louisiana, where the court actually has a doctrine that counts states, that's perfectly okay. Nothing wrong with that. But the, 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 if you make the direct circuit, what you have to do is you have to give an account of why the, ob the role obligation of the judge is connected somehow to democratic legitimacy but, but that, or that, to the meaning of the Constitution. In effect, that account is Ernie, which is to say two things. Number one, federalism is about liberty. I mean, it's a combination of Ernie and West Coast Hotel. Federalism but, is about liberty, but West Coast Hotel means that courts can't enforce but, liberty. So there are lots of liberty claims and, flying around all the time, Matt. Let me tell you, there are liberty claims flying around all the time in social movements going in opposite directions. Under your theory, the courts would have to accept all of them. They can't accept all of them. 
I mean, I mean, how is federalism? We have a long queue, so, so yeah. if you want, if you want Very to briefly, to how is federalism all about liberty, right? There is a relationship between federalism and liberty. What I would suggest is that the relationship is that federalism protects liberty indirectly by distributing government power. It doesn't protect liberty directly by visit, vindicating libertarian claims against economic conscription. I think is a very significant difference between the two. George. Uh, I want to just continue this discussion. Many of the arguments for basic uh, liberties have really been clothed in federalism. Right? For example, when uh, Roe against Wade uh, was first uh, put, uh, handed down, many people wanted to treat that as a federalism issue. And the states wanted to abolish uh, or permit the abortion that was their business. And the same is going to happen actually with uh, on gay marriage, as more and more states uh, uh, have constitutional provisions uh, forbidding it. You're going to get that challenge first under state constitutions. Well, you can't do it under state constitutions. That's the reason that they've uh, amended the constitution. It's going to be uh, challenged uh, under the federal constitution. And the same with the Second Amendment. If you're going to start applying those things, it all has to do with the incorporation doctrine from the 14th Amendment. So you've got this interplay with the so-called basic rights of the 14th Amendment, so-called federalism, which is used as a believer, because many people, as has been pointed out, don't like the mandate, regardless of where the hell the mandate comes from. It doesn't have to, whether it comes from the federal government or it comes from the state government or not. So you've got this constant tension between these two doctrines, and that's going to have to be sorted out. Uh, otherwise, basic rights is going to swallow everything. Well, federalism <laughs> is going to destroy a great deal of what we consider to be the basic rights, uh, at least as uh, set down by the Constitution, by the Supreme Court of the United States. Ready? Well, I think sometimes federalism does protect liberty directly. Sometimes it does it by creating competing centers of power, but sometimes it's, it's create, it protects it simply by saying, gee, the federal government wants to restrict a particular aspect of individual liberty, and they don't have power to do that because it's not within their enumerated powers. And, and if we'd never gotten a Bill of Rights, that's what all of these cases would have looked like. But the fact that we also have some specifically enumerated liberties doesn't mean that that dynamic isn't supposed to act a lot of the time. So I think it, it does it in both ways. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's in a whole lot of tension with McCulloch. Right? McCulloch says when something is within Congress's it, conceitedly constitutional enumerated ends, then Congress has wide discretion in terms of what kind of means it employs. And the debate about the mandate is a debate about congressional means. More coercive, more liberty restricting means were available to Congress. Congress, as a political accommodation to opponents of the mandate, chose a less coercive, more liberty protecting option. People would have options about what kind of insurance they would be required to obtain. The federal government wouldn't tax people and just give it to them. And so the idea that federalism doctrine is directly vindicating libertarian claims in a way that substantially reduces Congress's discretion to protect liberty more as opposed to less, I think, is a, is a proposition that's very difficult to square with McCulloch as well as um, McCulloch's there, recent reaffirmation in Comstock. There is no individual rights claim in McCulloch, and McCulloch's not the Constitution. Oh, yeah. So... Uh, I was interested to see sort of the... By the way, we can continue to have this debate after each question. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back to a question that he asked about uh, Neil's paper about the busted baseline for what it, uh, uh, relative which we assess unreinforced and unreinforced. I think it also applies to the other paper which essentially argues where sort of politics has intruded into the legal doctrine in this particular way. That implies a certain baseline of like what is the pure legal doctrine free of politics, or at least more free of politics than, uh, than it has become. Uh, and I think uh, sort of a difficulty for that claim is that you might think that if the, what is intruding is Wachnerism, and if it's the Wachnerism intruding on clear legal doctrine, then the most obvious way to intrude is actually on the due process clause claim, which courts have dismissed without uh, much ado. Uh, I think why they dismissed it, even though much of the public and the social movement and so forth uh, likes the idea in this context, because I think the doctrine in that area actually is clear. Even people like me, frankly, I don't like Williamson versus the optical, uh, but I admit that Williamson is on the books and it's pretty clear about what you do when there's an economic liberties claim. The reason why the federalism <coughs> community has been more successful is precisely because the doctrine in that area is in fact unclear. Uh, and it's not just uh, 
one monetary issue, think that, but also uh, look at every one of the opinions that have been written by judges upholding the mandate. They all recognize the Supreme Court has never addressed previously the question of whether the commerce power allows regulation of inactivity. And that doesn't mean that other presidents may not have something relevant to say about that, but it does mean that the issue is not clear and cut and dry in the way that Walker is clear and cut and dry today, or even in the way that uh, Dean Chemerinsky and others have suggested that it is. Uh, and I think that the fact that that can be more accessible than the other, and that you have a division of the judiciary along ideological lines, is an indication of the uh, lack of clarity doctrine. I think the second uh, related issue to this is the claim, well, there's sort of a mismatch between federal and jewelry. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up so quick. Uh, I think the, uh, it's interesting that the unanimous Supreme Court in, in Bond versus the United States recently said that federalism protects liberty. Uh, that's part of what it does. And, uh, the, it doesn't perfectly protect it, but one of the mechanisms is through imposing restrictions on federal power. But those states can still perhaps do the same thing. Uh, it's much easier to escape one state doing a mandate like Massachusetts than it is to escape uh, you know, a nationwide mandate. Uh, it seems to me that you, both, both papers, uh, I think we need to articulate a more clear theory perhaps of what is the baseline of how we should measure over enforcement versus under enforcement in the case of Brian's paper, uh, what is the baseline of sort of unpolluted or unpolitical or non-political uh, legal doctrine that uh, exists out there. Brian, uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll respond. Um, well, I, I, I don't mean to claim in the paper that um, I'm actually one of maybe the few people that actually thinks this is a close question and the doctrine is not entirely easy, particularly in the Commerce Clause issue. Um, I, that may be because I'm only a law student and these guys know a lot more than I do. Um, but uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily settled. And I, and I didn't mean to, I didn't, and I certainly don't, I don't think I, I don't think I say this in the paper, and I, d I definitely don't mean to assert it that this is, this is politics sort of sullying the legal process or, or legal doctrine or the outcome of judicial opinions, nor do I think that this is um, critical legal theory being proved. Um, I, think, I think in some ways that this is just an inevitable interaction between two realms that ask a lot of the same questions and answer them different ways. And I think that this is just showing it's a case study in the ways in which sometimes political and legal commitments are inevitably intertwined and that when there is a contestable issue on a particular constitutional question that sometimes, um, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the, the social meaning of a particular constitutional fact can sway that doctrine one way or the other. and. I also don't mean to suggest to say that, um, that the judicial perception of the social meaning uh, is, is outcome determinative or that, that's, um, that there's any sort of uh, you know, unseemly uh, opinion writing going on. It's just that I think that you know, it's, it, judges are human beings. They're a product of their time. They exist in this, this sphere. They, they make decisions against a social and political backdrop. And I think that a lot of times that those, the interaction of law and politics is, is unavoidable. All right, Barack, Jillian, and Bob. So some with Barack, and we'll try to get all three of you and before. So, so yeah. So quick question for Ernie and Jack: um, Is there a uh, is there an analog to con to popular constitutionalism that you might call popular regulation or popular court regulation? Um, you can imagine a situation where there are certain uh, areas of unenforcement or under enforcement. Uh, where state officials, state attorney generals, uh, are called, motivated by popular demand to bring suits where the federal government is normally has the authority, but doesn't bring the suits. This, of course, is, you know, in this case, we have Elliot Spitzer as the analog to Bill McCollum. Um, I wanted to know if institutionally uh, there are parallels. I guess that's a question for Jack. And uh, normatively, if one is appealing, this is for Ernie, would the other be appealing also? Well, you know, state attorney generals do bring suits all the time. I think I think he wants to get all the questions on yeah. the table. No, that's it. That's it. That's my answer. They do. It are, it, I, I only believe in it. I've seen it done. <laughs> but I think it's more interesting, and in, we're seeing it more in the statutory context, both immigration and securities law. Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of instances in which the states have more aggressively enforced particular constitutional restrictions um, than the federal government. But, but it would be appealing, I think, if they did. Yeah. Currently. Well, how, how the states have enforced in the domain or by, right, right. I mean, that, that's a way of compensating for under enforcement is to, to create state law.
Jillian, and followed by Bob, and then you all will have your parting shots as a way of answering both questions. I can be really brief because it actually works a lot of what Barack was, was, was saying, which is that um, it was a little bit for Ernie in terms of thinking about under enforcement um, in a wider context, right? So statutorily, in many ways, some of what has been under enforced has been pushed into other areas of law right. where the courts feel more competent because they're less less determinative. They do it through statutory interpretation, Congress and so on, and administrative law. And one of the section five of the Fourteenth Amendment. Right. Right. Um, and one of the interesting issues about the liberty claims is that I wonder whether we would actually see some of that, I think we already are a little bit, funneling in to review of regulation and kinds of search and scrutinies, different ways of getting at the same concerns, but without the frontally having to attack uh, the Williamson versus the optical kinds of things. Right. The aspects of the, of the state conscription that the states find truly uh, coercive will be, will be pushed <laughs> back <laughs> on in the administrative your, process. Your, 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 you got nothing. I come from a long line of Asian dictators. What's up? <laughs> 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 Bob, please. Uh, I want to uh, make a comment on confusion about collective action and the federal solution to it. Uh, the first, uh, let me proceed with two examples. The first example is building an Air Force base in State A or State B. It may be that everybody benefits in the country from having an Air Force base, a common defense, but the people in State A want to build there and the people in State B want to build there. So as a consequence, even though everyone benefits from the building of the, of the base, they may disagree politically about whether the base should be built if somebody proposes to build it in A. So the notion that in, in order to have a collective action problem, everybody's got a every state has got to favor it, <coughs> the solution that's proposed in the federal government is wrong. Now the second one concerns uh, another uh, classic example, which would be repealing a tariff. It may be that repealing a tariff pre protects industry in only one state and benefits consumers in all the states. So as a consequence, the beneficiaries gain much more than the loser, losers lose. Uh, it's not the case that everybody benefits in here at all. One state loses. Nevertheless, it's clearly the kind of collective action problem that was envisioned uh, in the uh, initial uh, formulation of the Constitution. So I think there's been a lot of loose talk about the connection between benefits, between favoring, between everyone benefiting, as to say, a play of gain or a cost-benefit gain where some gain more than the losers lose. Okay. So, Ted? Um, I, I, I'll say very little. I'm going to talk. I would just amplify that a lot of something you said, Ernie, that a lot of these contests spill out of the judicialized kind of constitutional law realm into statutory construction cases. And that's only, you know, as the ACA is rolled out and is implemented, that's only sort of statutory cases and administrative practice is going to, they're going to be kind of echoes of all of these, uh, both liberty and, and states, uh, state centered arguments. Jack, I've already spoken. I think for both Ernie and for Ted, uh, if you're going to talk about over-enforcing or under-enforcing federalism, I'll, I'll say one more time, you have to give some kind of account of what constitutional federalism is supposed to be doing for those claims to be normatively persuasive. Uh, I, the reason why I think uh, Brian's argument is persuasive, notwithstanding Ilya's good question, is because I think it seems to me if you're going to buy the argument that the mandate is beyond the scope of the commerce power, then you ought to be encouraging the Supreme Court to revisit Williamson against Lee Optical and vindicate a substantive due process claim here. I just don't understand the constitutional value system in which we should not have a substantive due process right against economic conscription, but we should have this kind of limit on the mandate. It's because the lower federal courts are limited by clear Supreme Court doctrine that the full force of Brian's argument is not publicly available for view. And finally, I want to strongly agree with Ernie's suggestion that the 11th Circuit opinion was 200 pages long. It was 300. <laughs> Majority. Depends on your format. So uh, I will, uh, in closing, try and offer, I think, what might be the, the only contribution I, I can actually make today, which is that the perspective of a law student in this debate. Um, and, and so I was a, I was a first year student in Professor Siegel's con law class actually when individual, the, the Affordable Care Act was, was passed and enacted the law. And so I've seen, I've seen this, this, the evolution of these legal claims um, as I was actually learning about constitutional law um, from the very beginning. And so, you know, even if this is a story that, that takes much longer than, uh, than a year and a half or two years, um, as Professor Balkan has mentioned, um, 
it does, I think, uh, illustrate in a very effective way that the, the ways in which arguments go from off the wall to on the wall. Uh, and that I think it, the, the, the conservative legal movements have, have really demonstrated, have put on a clinic in popular constitutionalism in a way that other um, political actors could learn from. And I think that um, two of those things that I noticed in the, uh, in, in the political sphere that I thought, I thought were effective in pressing their claims was uh, a, a fairly uh, high degree of courageous persistence or very early on. A lot of people um, were very persistent in these claims very early on, and they put a lot of credibility on the line in making these claims because a lot of the, I would say maybe the majority of the legal academic community rejected these claims at the threshold as being completely implausible. And second, I would say that the way in which the claims were made is, is largely descriptive rather than normative. They, they didn't make these claims in the sense that the Constitution should recognize uh, economic liberty or the constitutional law or constitutional doctrine should. It's that it does. And I, th I think that those are two um, broader takeaway lessons from this episode as a matter of popular constitutional law. Ian, final word. So I was scarred by being um, raised by critical legal theorists at Harvard Law School. But the one thing that they taught me was that there's a lot of ambiguity out there in the law. And I think there's lots of constitutional principles that we can't pin down the precise meaning of. And I think the task of constitutional theory and constitutional politics in the second half of the 20th century and the first part of this one has largely been how do we deal with basic ambiguities about constitutional meaning? Is there a way to live together and set up institutions and set up doctrines to deal with that fundamental ambiguity? So I don't think we have to pin down everything, the precise meaning of privacy or free speech or equality or federalism. I think we can still say you know, helpful things about how it should be enforced. Heard it here first, Ernie Young, is a critical theorist. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're going we're gonna to start the final session at, at five minutes after three. We'll give everyone the full break. Start at five after three. All right. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.